I'm just not somebody who believes that America is the world's policeman and that we should be going out telling other people what to do, how to do, and when to do it. That being said, on the Russian-Ukraine conflict, as an American, I can't be an impartial observer because my country has taken a side. And I'm not taking the side that's talking about taking a side right now. We made this conflict possible. We're the ones that we got issue. Maybe you could speak louder or to the mic like this. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> Just don't want to knock my teeth out, but <laughs> it's okay. I'm 61. Who cares? Uh, you know, but my, my point is, my government has taken a side. And it's not the side that we're, you know, the issue that we're funding Ukraine today and supporting Ukraine politically and diplomatically, etc. We started this war. We're the ones responsible for this conflict. And our responsibility goes back to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, we'll be talking about that a little bit. I wrote a book that touches on this, Disarming the Time of Perestroika. Um, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is, when the Soviet Union or when the Warsaw Pact collapsed in 1989, 1990, uh, there was discussions going on about what's going to happen in the post-Cold War environment. What's the role of NATO? What's the role of the Warsaw Pact? How does Germany reunify? People tend to forget today that Germany was an occupied country. And there's a reason why Germany was an occupied country. And that used to be called Nazi Germany. And they fought a war against the United States, the Soviet Union, and others, and we won. And when we won, we said no more Nazis. We occupied their country and we denazified them, or we tried to, or didn't we try to? I don't know. Werner von Braun got us to the moon. So, hey, you know, we didn't try that hard. But the point is, we, we pretended to be anti Nazi um, and we said never again. But what we didn't do is finalize it. There was no peace treaty, no peace treaty. And you know who had been asking for a peace treaty for all this time, for the decades of occupation? The Soviets. They're saying, we need to finalize the German issue. We would like to see a unified Germany, but we don't want to see a militarized Germany. We don't want to see a militarized, industrialized Germany. We need to have guarantees that this will never happen again. 27 million reasons why they didn't want it to happen again. And that's the number of Soviet citizens who lost their lives in the conflict against Nazi Germany. But in 1990, the Soviets were saying, hey, what can we do to make this dissolution work? We don't want it to devolve. We don't want it to become a problem. We don't want violence. We have 400,000 troops in East Germany occupying it because they lost the war, and the war ain't over till there's a peace treaty. But to get a peace treaty, we have to be certain that you're not going to take advantage of this, you being the United States and NATO that if Germany is unified, NATO won't expand. And Gorbachev was given assurance after assurance after assurance. Then Secretary of State James Baker spoke with Shevardnadze, spoke with Gorbachev. The German leader spoke with Shevardnadze, Gorbachev. The French leader, all the leaders spoke, and they all said the same thing, not one inch eastward. NATO will not expand one inch eastward. And so the Soviets left Germany, a peace treaty was negotiated and signed. Germany became unified. And instantly, the United States lied. And James Baker came back from his meeting with Gorbachev, met with the National Security Council, and said, hey, I told the guy, not one inch eastward. And they went, why? <laughs> why would you tell him that? We're going all the way, buddy. We're going all the way. You see, the United States had a policy about post-Soviet uh, the, the political existence. We never wanted Russia to rise up and challenge us the way that the Soviet Union did. We wanted to keep Russia down. And the best way to keep Russia down would be to expand NATO, gobbling up all those former Soviet bloc countries right up to the border of Russia, and then work in this post-Soviet reality to destabilize Russia economically. Ask yourself why Russia was such a nutcase in the 1990s. Now, a lot of people say, Gorbachev, yeah, he, he, bear, he bears responsibility. But the, you know, Yeltsin, yep, he was an alcoholic and a horrible leader. 
but it was the United States leading the charge, going in there with our capitalism and our democracy. And we had, we didn't have capitalism. Capitalism is supposed to be about the economy governed by something that resembles the rule of law. This was outright robbery, theft, pillaging. We were robbing them blind. We empowered a handful of people to become billionaires, and then we allowed them to take their billions out to our banks while we also stripped Russia of everything of value. Who suffered? The Russian people, and they suffered egregiously. Anybody who lived during that time will tell you it was the worst thing in their memory since the end of the Second World War. It was horrible, and we did it. We're to blame, and we did it on purpose. It wasn't by accident. Our goal was to get Russia to break up to get Russia to fragment into various constituent parts so that none of these parts would be by themselves able to challenge us. See, we were a paranoid superpower. We didn't want anybody to ever have the ability to challenge us like the Soviet Union did again. Now, that means that this conflict started decades ago. Decades ago. It was a, 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 it was a concept driven by the imperative to keep Russia down, keep Russia weak. In 1996, I mean, I mean, everybody's like, well, the Russians interfered with our election in 2016. Maybe, maybe not, probably not. But <laughs> we interfered in their election in 1996. We bought the darn thing. We stole it. We bragged about it. How many Russian newspapers have on their front cover, we stole the American election? None. Time Magazine has a cover story in 1996 saying, we bought the Russian election. We, America, we did it. We went in there and we got Yeltsin and he wasn't going to win the election. Zugan of the communist was coming back. We didn't want the communist back. So we bought the election and we're proud of it. We're bragging about it. So much for democracy. Then something happened. This unknown, this former KGB officer, this St. Petersburg bureaucrat emerged from nowhere to become first the head of the FSB, the follow on to the KGB, then prime minister. The next thing you know, he's president. And everybody's going, Vladimir who? Putin, who? Don't know him, don't know anything about him. He emerged from nowhere. He was literally the accidental president. You wanna know why he became president? He was the most honest man around Yeltsin at the time. Yeltsin was surrounded by something called the family. And the family was this, it was his immediate family, his daughter, son-in-law, but then all the oligarchs and all the people who rose up with Yeltsin pocketing billions of dollars, the most corrupt people on the planet. And they were circling Yeltsin like sharks because Yeltsin was old, Yeltsin was feeble, he was unhealthy, he was drunk. And they were waiting for Yeltsin to go away and then they were going to move in. And Yeltsin knew, knew when they moved in, he and his family, his immediate family, it was over. They were going to be arrested. They were going to die. It was going to be ugly. How does he save his skin and save Russia at the same time? Because I think Yeltsin was also starting to wake up that he had made a lot of mistakes. There was only one person in his entourage that he could trust. That was Vladimir Putin. Because Vladimir Putin just wanted to serve his country. Not a bone, not a corrupt bone in his body. Everybody goes, Scott, you can't say that. I know I can't say it because I never met the guy. But, you know, the consul general of St. Petersburg from the United States of America can say it. He met him repeatedly. And he said he's the most honest man out there, never takes a bribe, doesn't make any demands, simply listens to you, asks questions, and does his job. NGOs that went there, the leaders of non-governmental organizations met with him repeatedly. He's the only one who didn't slide a piece of paper across the table with a number on it. Because that's how you did business in, the, in Russia back then. You sat down. They went to sleep as you gave your pitch because they didn't care. All they wanted was cash in an envelope to the number that they slid across the table. The only guy that didn't do that was Vladimir Putin. You won't find anybody that'll say, I received a, a, a number from Putin and I gave him money. They'll say, I heard somebody said that. I, somebody thinks that happened. You won't find one person that says that happened because it didn't happen. I'm not saying Putin's perfect. He's not. I am saying he's the least corrupt individual <laughs> around uh, Boris Yeltsin at a time when Yeltsin was looking for somebody to step up and save Russia. And Putin stepped up and he saved Russia. You want to know what kind of guy this guy is? When Yeltsin came up to him and said, I need you to become president, he said, not me, babe. <laughs> I'm not, that's not my job. I'm not up to it. I don't want this job. And Yeltsin said, 
you got to take it. So he did. Yeltsin resigned, gave his New Year's address. Putin uh, filmed his New Year's address. And then you know what he did? Imagine this. He got on a helicopter and he flew to Chechnya where they were involved in a war, a horrible war. And his first act as president was to go visit the troops at the front and wish them a happy new year, shake their hands and say, you matter to me, you count. Guys, I know we're supposed to be peace activists, but I'm telling you as a former Marine, that's one hell of a gesture. To have your commander in chief, this is his first act, come to the front lines and meet you and tell you, I got your back. And he wasn't just telling the troops that, he was telling Russia that. I've got your back. Things are going to get better. I guarantee it. And he followed up. He did. He delivered on the goods. Ask anybody who's in Russia today. Compare and contrast what's going on in Russia today with what's going on in the 1990s. And you can't say, oh, it's worse today. You won't find anybody who says that. The 1990s was the worst. And Putin has made dramatic improvements. You know who's irritated about it? The United States. See, we didn't want Vladimir Putin to be in power. That's why we bought Boris Yeltsin his re-election in 1996. And we've been conspiring to undermine Putin ever since. Again, I'm talking about the roots of the current conflict began way, way back from the very beginning. The moment Vladimir Putin became president, we said he has to go because he's not the leader we want for Russia. He's talking about a strong Russia. We don't want a strong Russia. We want a weak Russia. We want a Russia that's compliant to the West, not a Russia that says we're the equal. Russia that wants a seat at the table. And so from 2000 until today, we've been engaged in a policy of regime change, trying to remove Vladimir Putin from power. Now, we tried to do it the soft way early on. You know, George W. Bush brought him over to the, the Crawford Ranch and looked him in the eyes, said, I saw his soul. I don't know, George, if you're that good, <laughs> you better run for a third term <laughs> because you got God on your side. But the, the point is, you know, Putin was just being Putin. You know, he wasn't exposing his soul. He was just being very blunt about who he is and what he is and what he wants for Russia. What he doesn't want is Russia to be challenging the United States on the global stage. What he does want is for Russia to assume its natural place in the world. When I say natural place, understand it's one of the largest energy producers in the world. It's an economic powerhouse. We have people saying it's just a gas station design, it disguises a country. Really? How's that working, guys? I mean, if you're going to mock a country and call it a gas station disguised as a country, don't be an automobile stuck in the middle of nowhere with an empty gas tank. Because suddenly that gas station disguised as a country is looking pretty relevant, pretty good. Um, Again, we can go into the history of this. We could talk about the Obama administration, the reset. Remember the button, red button, yellow box, push it. Everything's fine and dandy. Misspelled word. Doesn't mean what it wanted. Didn't work because it wasn't about a reset with Russia. It was about regime change. The reason why we went into a reset is because Putin had done his two legal terms on the Constitution, couldn't run for a third consecutive term. So he did a flop with uh, he did a flop with uh, the, the prime minister, who was uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Medvedev is now president. Putin is now prime minister. And we went, here's our chance. Suddenly, we're all nice with Russia. Hey, Dmitry, looking pretty good, buddy. Want to go out to dinner, a movie, a date with America? We like you now. We're your friend. We want to help you. Let me help you. And Medvedev went, uh, well, what we'd like you to do is um, get back in the ABM treaty. Not so fast, Dimitri, on the first date, really, man. <laughs> Calm down, chill it. No ABM treaty. Not going to do that. Well, we, we'd like it if you didn't bomb Libya. Come on, buddy. D me, baby. No, we're going to bomb Libya. We're going to do anything we want. Don't you understand the nature of the relationship here? We just want you to kneel before us and bow like Yeltsin did. And Medvedev wasn't going to play that game. Joe Biden was vice president at that time. Joe Biden was heavily involved in trying to undermine Vladimir Putin's return. Imagine if you would, in an American election, if a senior Russian, let's say Medvedev himself, flew to the United States, let's say it happens next year, 2023, and he meets with the Republican Party, the opposition, and he says, 
Joe Biden shouldn't run for re-election. It'll be bad for Joe Biden. It'll be bad for America. I don't care where you stand in politics. That should just irritate the living you know what out of you. A foreigner doesn't come to my country and tell me what's good for my country, tell me what's good for anybody. Get the hell out of my country. But Joe Biden flew to Moscow, met with the opposition, and said Putin shouldn't run for re-election. It'd be bad for Russia, bad for Putin. Because our policy was regime change. Putin ran for election, won, and he's back in the president. But now he knows where the United States stands. We're trying to remove him from power. The Maidan revolution of 2014 was a coup d'etat in Kiev. You can pretend it's a revolution, but it wasn't. It started out as a peaceful demonstration. I'm not denying that the first demonstrators in Maidan in, the, uh, in December of 2013 were, I believe they were there to peacefully demonstrate against a decision made by the lawfully elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, not to pivot to the EU, but to stick with Moscow. And they said, you betrayed us. You promised we're going to EU. Hey, you know what? You have a right to demonstrate. Please demonstrate peacefully. And if enough of you come out there and you can get sort of this gravitas, maybe you can get him to change his mind. But the United States didn't want a peaceful demonstration. We wanted the violent overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych. So we went to our old buddies, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN-B, B for Bandera, Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera is one of the most odious characters in global history. He's a man who believes in the supremacy of the Ukrainian nationality. Now, that's okay. I'm proud to be American too, you know? But see, I don't want to go around and kill everybody because I'm an American. But Stepan Bandera didn't just want to kill people. He did kill people. The thousands of men who operated under his command are responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of Jews. The massacre in Lvov, when the Germans went in in 1939, Bandera's guys did it. The people who pulled the trigger in Babiar in 1941, Bandera's people. Ask the Poles how they feel about Volin, a region in Poland where over 110,000 Polish men, women, and children were slaughtered by Bandera's people. You know what their specialty was? To go to a village, take everybody, put them in a barn, then set it on fire and sit back and laugh as the people burned to death. Any people who managed to get out, they'd shoot for fun because they really got off on this kind of thing. And they killed hundreds of thousands of Russians too. Now, Bandera is a Ukrainian nationalist. So he originally fought on the side of the Germans against the Soviets. And then later on, when the Germans didn't get him what he wanted, they put him in a sort of a soft prison, but they released him later on so he could fight again. Then when the Germans went away, he continued to stay in place and fight the Soviets, first as undercover force for the Germans working for German intelligence, Nazi intelligence, I should be clear, a guy named Galen, the Galen organization. And then when Nazi Germany was defeated, we came in and we brought in Galen. We said, don't surrender, boss. Just come over. You work for us now. We want your whole organization. I know you guys are Nazis. I know you committed war crimes, but we don't care. We want the people you control in the former Soviet Union, including Stepan Bandera, and they're going to work for us now. So from 1945 to 1954, we ran a covert war against the Soviets in Ukraine using Stepan Bandera's Organization for Ukrainian Nationalists. Uh, this war cost about 300,000 people their lives. How many Americans know about this war? Not too many. Not too many. 300,000 people, 200,000 Ukrainians, 100,000 Russians. The, the, depending on your numbers, the, the Soviets lost between 8,000 and 30,000 of their own troops. So this isn't a small little, you know, Red Army faction thing killing a person here. This is straight up war. And it went from 1945 to 1954, and it was funded by the United States of America, the Central Intelligence Agency. Now they got beat. And what happened to these people when they got beat? They fled to Europe, and then they went on diaspora. They went to Canada. They came here to the United States. In Ellaville, New York, 60 miles away from where I live, there's a park called Heroes Park. And in Heroes Park, they have the statues of Stepan Bandera, Roman Stukovich, and other neo-Nazi mass murderers. And every summer, they bring kids in who wear brown Nazi uniforms, and they parade around holding the photographs of these people up, praising their works. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Now, those words by themselves, I mean, yeah, I say, 
Glory to the Marine Corps. You know, Scott Ritter, you're a racist. No, I'm not. I'm just praising the Marine Corps. But when you say Slava Ukraina, as Nancy Pelosi did proudly on the floor of the United States Congress, you're, it's like saying Sig Heil. Now, do you want to tell me that Sig Heil just means to victory? Sig Heil. I'm just saying to victory. No, you know those two words and my hand goes up. You know what that is. That's a Nazi salute and a Nazi cry. So let's not pretend that Slava Ukraina is not what it is. It's the cry of the Bandera movement. It is a cry of Ukrainian white supremacy, Ukrainian Aryan supremacy, and the arrogance of the Ukrainian nationalists that they have a right to kill the subhumans, Poles, Russians, Jews. We put them in power, ladies and gentlemen. 2014, we put them in power. Now, some in Congress got a little irritated about that. Starting in 2015, because we were providing hundreds of millions of dollars per year to train the Ukrainian army. We'll get to that in a second. But Congress went, whoa, wait a minute. There's a Nazi problem in, in Ukraine, a Nazi problem. Everybody knew it. It's the Bandera movement, the right sector, Sloboda, Azov Battalion. So Congress put an amendment on the defense appropriations bill that said, you can't take our money and use it to train the Nazis. They use that term, the Nazis. In 2019, the Democrats wrote a letter to then Secretary of State Pompeo. They said, why aren't you labeling the Nazis a foreign terrorist organization? Because they're a white supremacist neo-Nazi group. Why are we supporting them? Why are we tolerating them? Congress knew exactly who these people are and what they represented until Russia went into Ukraine. And then it's like the memory's wiped. Jamie Raskin was one of these congressmen who signed a letter to Pompeo condemning the policies of the Trump administration for funding Nazis. But on April 28th, after he sent out a tweet praising the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I support that, by the way, the Holocaust should never be forgotten, ever, never again. I believe that. Does Jamie believe that? He tweeted about it, but then he went on the floor of Congress and chastised a Republican congressperson. I'm not here singing her praises, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We all know she's not perfect, but she got up there and she was saying the right thing. We're funding Nazis. Why are we funding Nazis? And he said, what Nazis? You have no proof. Jamie, I have your name on a letter. You signed the letter saying there's Nazis in Ukraine. But they're still there. They haven't gone away. And the problem manifests itself over and over again. And what I'm trying to get at here, ladies and gentlemen, is that when we have this conflict in Ukraine, there's history. And you can either be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. You can't be in the middle, especially if you're an American, because your government has aligned itself to the wrong side of history. If you're supporting the Nazis, you're on the wrong side of history. If you've been trying to undermine the Russians, overthrow the Russian government, push them into a corner by trying to invite Ukraine into NATO, even though you promised never to expand NATO, you're on the wrong side of history. Now, when I was back protesting the war in Iraq, I used to say that, first of all, I'm not a pacifist. I hope you guys know that. Don't condemn me, but I'm not. You want to fight my country, I'll kill every one of you. I don't believe in peace. I believe in war. But I believe war should be the last thing we ever do, that we have to exhaust every possibility short of war before we go to war. Every possibility. We should never send people off to die in combat if there's the potential to resolve this problem peacefully. You know who exhausted every possibility short of war before making the decision to go into Ukraine? Vladimir Putin. He did everything. He did everything. There was, a, there was a negotiated peace in 2015, the Minsk Agreement. And it wasn't that Putin was trying to impose it on Ukraine. France and Germany came together in something called the Normandy Format, and they're the ones that took the lead and said, we need peace. We need to bring this issue to an end. Russia, work with us on this. And Putin said, okay, I'll work with you if you guys are serious about it. They said, we're serious. They said to the Ukrainians, all these people that you're trying to kill in the Donbass, these Russians, what needs to happen is you have to pass laws that protect their rights. Give them some sort of autonomy so that they don't fall victim to your anti-Russian laws that you've been passing. Again, right side of history, wrong side of history. Go to the laws that have been passed by the Ukrainian parliament that ban the Russian language, ban Russian culture, ban Russian everything. Now, remove the term Russian, insert the term Jew. 
and you have the same laws that Germany passed in the 1930s. Right side of history, wrong side of history. Putin's on the right side of history, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'll take questions from you later on about this, but I just wanted to set this up where I come from on the issue of what's going on in Ukraine today. I'm on the right side of history. That's my opinion. You're welcome to challenge me. Now, this war is a bad deal. It's, it's a horrible war. I'm not sitting here saying, yay, Russia, kill more Ukrainians. It's the last thing I'm saying. I'm actually saying we need to be working overtime, we being the United States, since we started this conflict, we need to be working overtime to have an off-ramp to this conflict. And people say, well, things are so bad today. How could you possibly talk about a diplomatic off-ramp? There will never be good relations between the United States and Russia. I said, wow, I think I've heard this before. It was in the 1980s when I was in the Marine Corps. You know, we called them the evil empire. They called us enemy number one. We almost went to nuclear war several times. We had hundreds of thousands of men on the border of Germany. They had hundreds of thousands of men on the border in East Germany. We were ready to go to war at a drop of a hat. Things were really bad. We had built new nuclear weapons. They had the SS-20 missile. We had the Pershing missile. And we were this close to global nuclear annihilation. I'm not joking. It was real. I was there. I know. You know what happened? We signed a treaty. As bad as relations were, we signed a treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and we worked with the Soviets to get rid of an entire class of weapons that were threatening Europe and the world with annihilation. I was involved in that treaty. I came in on the ground floor. One of the proudest things in my resume, it's sort of an ego thing, but I, I'm proud of it nonetheless. I was the first inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union. Number one, baby. It was an accident. Should have happened. When they recruited me, they thought I spoke Russian. I took Russian. It's on my resume. But I was in college. I was playing football and drinking beer. And Russian was not in the top of my priority. I did enough to pass. And it shows that I passed. But the headquarters Marine Corps said, we need Russian speakers. Ritter speaks Russian. Send them to the agency. I showed up, and they had a lieutenant colonel. Uh, we call him Pulumyot Kelly. Pulumyot means machine gun. And it wasn't because he was deadly with a machine gun. He was. He was a Marine. But it was because he spoke Russian so fast. He was fluent. Even the Russians said, you speak Russian so well that we know you're not a Russian. You speak it better than the Russians do. You're grammatically correct every single time. And I had walked in as a first lieutenant in an organization that had nothing but majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels. I was literally a fish out of water. It was so bad that when I showed up, this is no joke, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel came up and said, Lieutenant, coffee machine's over there. The implication was the only thing I was good for was getting coffee. Well, I didn't get him coffee uh, because the general walked in at that time and, and you know, introduced himself to everybody. And, um, and when the general left, this uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel came up and said, uh, who are you and why are you here? You understand that everybody here is the best expert on the Soviet Union in the United States military. They're all foreign area officers. They all have advanced degrees. They all speak the language fluently. They all have been immersed in the culture. Many of them have done tours in Moscow as defense attaches, spying. And many of them have served in the unit U.S. military liaison mission in East Germany, spying. These are the real guys, the real deal. These are the superstars of the Cold War. Why are you here? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I got orders. <laughs> I was supposed to go to the Marine Corps and kill people, but they brought me here and I don't know why. And he said, do you want to be an inspector? I said, yes, sir. I want to be an inspector. He said, okay, we'll make you one. But then Pullum Yo Kelly found out, tested my Russian, found out I was inadequate, called me an embarrassment to the Marine Corps, an embarrassment to the service. And he fired me on the spot. He said, you're going home to the Marine Corps. We don't know why you sent, they sent you here. Long story short, being, you know, Marine officers, abhor leadership vacuums. We don't do well when we look for, we look and we say something needs to be done and nobody's doing it. We have a tendency to say, then I have to do it. And before they fired me, I found my, I wriggled my way into doing certain things like running counterintelligence for the entire organization. Uh, how that happened, you read about in the book. But <laughs> the bottom line is I was doing something that I wasn't qualified to do, and I was doing it at a big level. I got the Assistant Secretary of Defense to do a special access program on 
counterintelligence polygraph program. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And the general decided it was the worst thing in the world. And uh, he dissolved it. But in doing so, he said, I like your gumption. And then he said, uh, I'm going to send you over to this new group of inspectors called portal monitors. Their job is to go to Vodkinsk, this Soviet missile factory, 700 miles east of Moscow, where they are, used to produce missiles at SS-20. And we have to make sure they aren't producing them anymore. So you're going to be part of the team outside that factory. In June, they sent me there 14 days before the treaty was implemented with an advanced party of inspectors to help pave the way for the arrival of 30 Americans full time living there. That's how I got to be the first person inspector in Russia, because when the clock ticked over on July 1st, the treaty's in force. I'm on the ground. And Colonel Kelly, I'm here, buddy. <laughs> You're flying in on an airplane still. You're the second inspector on the ground. But um, I'm not that petty. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but the, what we did for the next couple of years was just a fantastic. It was the, one of the best things in my life. I went from being a Marine who trained to, who, who lived and breathed killing Russians to a guy who was working with Russians to get rid of the missiles that were threatening global peace. It was one of the most transformative moments in my life. And I loved every aspect of it. But the key takeaway here isn't just that it was a cool story. Hey, it's a cool story. But the key takeaway is that it provides a template on how we can do it, how we can repair relations with the Russia. You see, right now we don't have active arms control. We have a treaty that nobody's paying attention to. They're not even letting inspectors operate right now. Relations are so bad. The INF treaty that I was involved in no longer exists. And yet the weapons are coming back and they're providing the same level of threat. Everybody's talking about the potential of nuclear conflict. So how do we get out of this mess? George Santayana, American philosopher, said those who forget the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. But the implication there is that the lessons of history are bad. Sometimes the lesson of history is good. Sometimes the lesson of history is a success story. And those who fail to learn the successes of history are condemned not to have the opportunity to repeat it. This book provides a template of hope on how the United States and Russia can move forward from this horrible situation we're in today. So I encourage people to uh, buy the book, 